now with a presentation from Samuel uh, on accessibility. Uh, he's been working on this topic for many years. Um, on a side note, we really need someone uh, to help us with the video recording. Uh, we cannot have just one person doing that. So um, if you are interested in learning how to do it, it's very simple. Just uh, come and or just go see Julien and uh, yeah, it's going to work out. Thank you very much. Samuel. <laughs> Can you switch me on? Yeah, thanks. Um, so we talk about accessibility on a very technical side, uh, so you can understand how it plugs into the graphical desktop task, uh, stack that you know. Uh, so I have put the slides on braille.thefreecat.org if you want to um, uh, get uh, back to the previous slides. Um, so I will first introduce a bit about accessibility uh, to explain the basic needs, uh, the basic principles of accessibility. Then I will talk a bit about what happens when you press A on a key and it shows up on the screen uh, because not everybody knows everything along the path. So I will just uh, bring back your memory uh, and things. And then I will discuss about accessibility on the input side first and then on the output side. And especially on, on the input side, there are a lot of things there, um, particularly concerning uh, XORG. So first, uh, just a quick question. What do you think uh, can pose accessibility issues here? Or what is the kind of problems we have there? So it's graphical, so OK, there is a text version of GNU plot, but what else? Mm? Colors. Colors, yes, exactly. I would like to know how many of you are colorblind. Please raise your hand if you don't distinguish at least some colors. So there are like three people out of, I don't know, 15 uh, maybe. So that's a lot, actually. There are 8% of the male people who are colorblind. So that's huge, actually. Um, so what is accessibility? So it's contracted A11Y. Um, it means being usable by People with specific needs, it doesn't necessarily mean handicap or whatever, it's just specific needs. Um, so of course you would think about blind people, but there are also people with just uh, low vision. Uh, they can see, but not so well. Of course, there are deaf people. Um, for XORG it doesn't matter so much, but uh, that's important. Uh, colorblind, as I said. People with just one hand, Try to press control at backspace with just one hand. <laughs> um, cognition issues, so you have difficulties in understanding complex interfaces and things like this. Uh, motor disability, so using a keyboard with Parkinson is quite difficult if you don't have something that helps you. And elderly people who basically have everything at the same time. <laughs> so. If you're interested, there are some how-tos which bring some, some information about all of these uh, in more details. And the important thing to understand is that maybe it's you. Maybe not now, maybe in 20 years, maybe next week. You may break your arm and then you have only one hand and you cannot press control at backspace anymore. Uh, so accessibility, it, it's not just handicap, because handicap depends on the situation and on the time. Maybe you will have just one hand for one week, and then you will have your two hands again, etc. cetera. Um, and then the question quickly comes, but why the hell would you want to make a, a graphical interface accessible to blind people while well, there is text mode, which is so much easier to make accessible? Uh, the problem is simply software. There is a lot of stuff which is not available in text mode. If you want to have JavaScript support, you have to have a graphical uh, navigator because it, otherwise it doesn't really work um, properly. And perhaps you also have business applications. And if you don't want to lose your job, you have to use the software that you have to use. And then you have no choice. Uh, you have to use a graphical desktop. And a more social thing is that when you are non-technical, uh, you usually need some help from people around, and they are not technical either. And if you have your own software, then 
they will not be at ease with helping you because they will say, okay, I don't know your software, I don't know how to help you. While if everybody has the same software, then people can get uh, help from others and it works fine. Um, another common thing that people would think about is uh, writing dedicated software. So I've mentioned uh, some things. Um, generally, it's a bad idea. Uh, first, just because when, peop when somebody writes a software for disabled people, they will think about their disability and that will make a software which is suited to that person but maybe not other people. So uh, it's better to try to uh, make accessibility uh, in general. And then there is the lack of power, uh, of manpower. For instance, ED Browse has some JavaScript support, but it, it, it cannot work on, on the long term. Uh, you do not want to implement a web browser nowadays. You would just use the existing ones because you you don't want to implement JavaScript, Flash, etc., etc. And the same for an Office Suite. The compatibility with Word, etc., is a pain to um, to maintain. And as I said, it's better to use the same software when you work with uh, somebody, uh, just to understand each other, exchange files, etc. It works much better. So that's why it's better to make the existing applications accessible. So there are three main principles that you would have is just the same software made accessible for a lot of reasons. Um, another thing which is not obvious is you want to have synchronization between both people using the software, both the, the disabled and the non-disabled people. That is, you just have uh, alternate input and output of the same thing so that the two people working together can un understand each other. If somebody sees something that the other one doesn't see, then you have problems with working together. And you want this to be pervasive. That is, uh, when you go to a library or whatever, you have uh, a computer for, I don't know, finding book books in the libraries and things like this. Uh, you don't want to have to ask for the system administrator for installing some software, configuring it, Anyway, he's not here, so you cannot contact him. So ideally, it should be available on all platforms uh, all the time, just ready to be uh, enabled. Um, just to give a few uh, ideas about the status we have uh, on the free software side. So text mode is uh, quite well accessible, but for beginners, it's not really an option quite often. Uh, GNOME is quite fine. Uh, we have still had uh, quite a regression with GNOME 3 because they, they have re-implemented a lot of things. Um, and in the end, we are quite late compared to the Windows world because we have started just uh, some time ago and not so much. And compared to Apple, we are really at Stone Age. Uh, Apple made a lot of efforts uh, into accessibility. They even have um, practice lessons at their Apple Store for people to understand how to use the accessibility software, etc. And it's integrated into the computer. You just have to enable it. And we don't really have this in the free software side. That's uh, uh, quite sad. So that was just an introduction about accessibility. I will talk about the A uh, press. So starting from the beginning, oops, sorry. So we have the um, the keyboard. Um, wait, wait, ne never mind. So we have the keyboard. So you press the A key on the keyboard. I mean on the QWERTY keyboard. So you actually press the third row and first key of the third row. And for the keyboard, he doesn't care about what is printed on, on the key. So one E just. Uh, means the physical position of the key. And so we have the driver in the Linux kernel which takes this and translate that into uh, an internal kernel uh, value which is actually the same but uh, that's um, another space. And so the input layer pushes that to the EVDEV driver which pushes that to in the input EVDEV driver of the X server which adds 8 just because it prefers that value uh, and pushes that over the wire to the X client. And so what is pushed to the client is a key code that is a physical position and not A. It's just the third row, first key. Um, and then here, 
this is just an event among all the other events uh, of, the, of the client. So there is the toolkit which will uh, get this event and see, it, okay, it is a key press. I will push that to XKB, which translates that into a key sim. So now it is really A. Um, and then the input engine turns that into a signal which is sent to the widget, which decides to do something. For instance, append A to the text. And then we have the output. So the widget has some text which it wants to uh, output. It will use actually nowadays uh, a text rendering engine like Pango. Uh, and so what gets out of the client is a pix map, not text, and which is pushed uh, to the driver and to the video card. So we have a pix map really early, right in, in the client. Um, and one thing is there's n perhaps no screen. Please do not make drivers which assume that there is a screen which is plugged. Blind people don't have screens. They don't care. So if the driver doesn't want to start, that's really a problem for them because they have to buy a screen which they won't use. Um, okay, so that was the story. And then I'll talk about input, which is a long thing, actually. There are, there are a lot of things. Um, so. First, with motor disability, some people may be able to use only some things, like just the keyboard, and then they cannot use the mouse, so you can use keyboard shortcuts, or you can use um, something I will explain later to actually move the mouse with the keyboard. Um, maybe they can only use a joystick, they cannot even move a mouse, just a joystick, and then you make a mouse out of this. And if you only have a joystick or a mouse or just one button and you want to type text, then you can use uh, a virtual keyboard, for instance. And there are a lot of things I cannot even imagine about because you never know what people may need. Um, so if you only have one hand and that it is permanent, then you would like to have a, a fast way of typing things. And if you had to use a standard keyboard, you would have to move the, mm, the hand quite a lot to access all the keys. So one way to do this is to use a toggle that mirrors the keyboard like this, so that you can keep, for instance, your left hand on the left, and you can switch uh, between the normal layout and the verted uh, layout. Uh, so this is not implemented in XOR. I'm not sure exactly where to implement it, and the actual layout details, I, I don't know, but that's something that we, we could implement. I couldn't hear. Okay. Oh, XP does have this? It could. It could do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's uh, it has to be done some way. Um, so XSX is this kind of thing uh, implemented in XKB. Uh, th so there are a lot of things like sticky keys. So to press Control Alt Backspace, you actually press Control several times to uh, lock it, and then Alt several times, and then you press con uh, Backspace. So it sticks uh, the, um, the modifier. Uh, mouse keys is just turning the keyboard into a mouse. Slow keys means uh, you have to um, uh, keep the key pressed a long time before it actually shows up. Just because people are really slow, uh, have problems with moving their hands. Or conversely, uh, you want to slow down the repeat because then they will keep the key pressed for a long time and then it will repeat a lot, so you slow down this. Um, toggle keys would alert when you press caps lock, caps lock and things like this. Bounce keys is particularly for Parkinson, so it will, if it gets a lot of keystrokes in a short period of time, it will only take one of them, uh, so that if you press, because you have Parkinson's, uh, you'd only have one key press. So this is all implemented in XKB, uh, both in the X server and X client, depending on the precise details. Um, so virtual keyboard is mostly like this, so you have a keyboard and you can click with the mouse, so there are some details about uh, focus, but ba basically that's this. Um, and it works by just injecting key presses right here between the X server and the X client. So it injects 
uh, key codes, so physical positions. So it works well with um, uh, an actual PC keyboard uh, shown on the screen. And for Braille devices, that's a bit the same, at least for some of them. Uh, some Braille devices have a classical PC keyboard, so you can type. And what we have nowadays is Braille TTY, which discusses with the device and injects these physical positions right into the kernel, so it works both in text mode and X.org. It's just a new keyboard, actually, for the kernel, uh, which is fed from user space. So there's no problem here. The problem comes when you have a Braille keyboard. A Braille keyboard is a keyboard with eight keys, which corresponds to the eight dots of um, Braille. Uh, so you have 256 uh, different possibilities. Um, so just a couple of details, only A to Z is standard. The rest is completely dependent on both the language, it's not the same in English and in French, on the country, uh, Belgium, Canada and France doesn't have the same, and even on usage, French Braille has moved quite a bit, uh, and some people use something else, etc. So the translation is far from simple. And the problem is also that we have a key sim here, because I press uh, B, for instance, on my Braille keyboard, it's B, it's not the physical position on the PC keyboard. So what I would like to do is give the X server a key sim, but there's nothing like this, just because it's a key code which gets out of the server. So I could try to inject that into the client, there's nothing like this at the moment. Um, so what we do at the moment is back translate thanks to XKB into a key code, which is horrible. I will talk a bit maybe later uh, about some things, but that, that's one of the solutions that we have, and of course it poses a lot of problems, because if you want to type capital A, then you have to find the modifier to make the capital. If you want to press uh, O with the circumflex, you have to find the combining O or the uh, dead O, the, the, the combining circumflex or dead circumflex. The, some people, what they do is remap one uh, key code into what they need, then simulate it, and then uh, remap it back to what it was, which is horrible, but it works. Um, some people would like to use the main PC keyboard as a Braille uh, keyboard. Uh, so you would have two steps. You take these keys, A, A S, D, F, turn that into dots, and then turn that in, into text. Um, so what I did was to implement it in XKB, uh, so we have these two key presses, F and D, um, which the layout turns into Braille.1 and 2, so there are several layouts depending on people. And so we have an actual Braille keyboard, and there is some filter which combines them into one and two at the same time. And then we can use X-Compose, for instance, to turn that into uh, some key sim. It's a bit of a hack, but it works quite well. Um, another way to do all of this uh, is due, actually, to another thing which is horrible with Braille, um, which is that I talk only about grade zero, that is, we have a bijection between dots and uh, a letter. But actually, people would like to use abbreviation just to type faster. So, for instance, the Asian suffix is coded like this in Braille. There is ambiguity, that is, it's the same as capital N, so there are some rules to uh, rule out the um, ambiguity, uh, but it's really complex. So, in the end, we have to use an IBUS module, for instance, so that you have all the key presses which get into the client, and then IBUS gives that to an external server which does everything that is needed and configurable and everything, and then turns that it, it to be. So it works quite well. So this is really recent. We, we have done this um, this uh, summer with the Google Summer of Code um, program. Um, so I would like to ask, well, how about Wayland? Is it passing key codes, key sims? Uh, I've dug a bit. Uh, I haven't really found this kind of details. Uh, so ideally, you should be able to do both. Uh, so we can inject both key codes and key sims depending on what we have. Uh, so perhaps it's the opportunity to, to, to fix these things before we, we have everything, this installed on all desktops. Um, at the moment we're sending key codes as far as I know. 
but I also admit the uh, I don't really know the Wayland client stack that well. I, I'm know. sorry, I couldn't hear. At, at the moment, we're passing key codes as far as okay. I know. But I also admit I've only done the, the lower level so far. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't really looked at the client bits. So if anyone else can uh, chime in the client bits a bit more. Mm. Okay. So this was about input. Maybe there are some questions already. Yes? Uh, I, I could not hear. The text, yeah. text mode or text? text well, I, I will talk about uh, output later, but text it's for what? For the input. Yeah. I, I don't know about this. Well, for, for me, it's a solution like this. So, well, so with ne never mind. So, with Wayland, there's a uh, protocol extension above the uh, default input events, and that's the text protocol, and that is specifically designed that um, to do most of that stuff. Okay. Well, we we can discuss about yeah. it later, maybe. Yes. How does it work in practice? Is a regular PC keyboard and you could drive because, as far as I know, many PC keyboards do not like. Yes. You have to have a good keyboard, yeah. so you can actually press independently all the keys. At least some of your keyboard no, uh, would be independent. Okay, so now let's talk about output. It's a bit more complex uh, for some things. At least uh, we ha already have uh, a lot of things which are implemented. So for people with low vision, uh, they can, for instance, just tweak the DPI so that uh, we express that for us the screen is small and then the desktop will use big icons and fonts and everything. Uh, we can use XR and R panning support which provides actually some zoom, some basic zoom. And with gamma tuning and color inversion you can improve uh, the, f depending on the people uh, how they see colors. Um, just reverting the screen, I don't know why but some people like it. Uh, don't ask, I don't know. Um, GTK3 has a way to get a perfect magnif magnification. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I've never had the time to work on this. The idea would be to ask the application to render its window in a big pix map, and then you can show that. The good thing is it's perfect because it's perfectly drawn. Instead of taking a pix map and then zoom it in, that's much better doing it this way. Um, so, but the problem is that for blind people it's not enough because they just don't see anything. And also a lot of things like a virtual keyboard, you want to have just the buttons shown on the screen available uh, directly and things like this. And so you wouldn't want to patch the rendering but rather get the semantics from uh, the application. And now, uh, quite a long time ago that was done by just uh, snooping the X protocol so you would see the text going from the client to the server. But nowadays it's impossible because you have big map uh, over the wire. And so the idea is that we have this application which is rendering something, but somewhere there is some abstract representation. And this is what is being exposed through a bus through the screen reader to be then rendered uh, on some devices. Um, so the idea is that so we have our widget which is getting A, it will both push the text for rendering and also send a signal to ATK which is just the library which, which turns that call into a message which is sent over the bus to the screen reader which can then uh, write this uh, through braille or speech or whatever. Um, and conversely, the, um, the screen reader wants to inspect what the application is doing. And so it will send a get, get text message which a TK receives and picks the text from the widget and send it back to the screen reader. So that allows to get the text but also um, the parent, the children and everything. So that when you have an application which is like this, we, you have a window with some container, a menu, some buttons, etc. The screen reader can actually browse through all this 
and then get the information and expose that to the user the way he likes. So either a virtual keyboard or um, braille device or speech or whatever. Um, so technically speaking, this works well uh, with, for instance, JTK and soon enough uh, KDE applications. Uh, Adobe did this for Acrobat Reader and they spent the effort uh, for this. And of course, all the old applications which uh, do not use ATK are not accessible. Um, but still, in practice, even if technically they are accessible, that's not enough. Because, for instance, if you have this kind of uh, dialog box and you have coded it, it like this, so you have first a colon with first name, last name, password, and then a second colon with foo barbars, when you are on foo, you don't know whether it's the first name or the last name. So what you would have to do in your application is rather to define a label for some text, and then the screen reader knows the semantics between the label and the text. Um, when that's not the case, what we do is actually use some scripts uh, in the screen reader to match all of these by hand, actually. So it's a bit patching, it's sad, but uh, when you don't really control the source code, uh, you have to do this. Um, so in the end, making an application accessible is not so difficult. It's just making it accessible from the start by just making it uh, logical um, and just writing, actually it's common sense to write things uh, logically and not visually. Um, so design your application without the graphical output in mind so that you only have some logic in there and then the screen reader will, will be happy. It's a bit like CSS actually. And if possible, just use standard widgets because they have been made accessible. If you write your own uh, widget, then you will have to implement ATK to expose the information for the screen reader. And you, if you have some image, you have to provide an, uh, a text, uh, an alternative text uh, for this so that the screen reader can read it. And keep things simple. That will help everybody. That will particularly help people with cognition issues, but everybody actually. So keep it simple. Um, so there are some pitfalls I uh, won't detail. You have a tool which um, allows you to check that you actually expose information. Uh, so it's called Accessizer and you see all the applications and you can see the tree of widgets in there and check that you have the actual text from the widgets. Um, there is some documentation, documentation, so the accessibility how-tos are quite old, but they are still really interesting to read. Um, GNOME has written a development guide uh, for GTK applications, but it's quite general, actually. Um, so to conclude, um, so accessibility has a lot of various needs that you wouldn't even think about. Uh, so it plugs at various level in, in the stack, and it needs various tweaks. We have seen some of them for the keyboard. And the thing is, with Wayland, we need no regression there, because people will not be able to use their computer anymore at all because they cannot press keys, etc. Uh, so we have to pay a lot of at attention there. And as I said, accessibility does not necessarily need the rendering but also the semantics. Um, so the idea is just to separate the form from the content so you, the screen readers can access the content and have and the logic of the content. And then there is some form for the screen, but also for the screen reader. Okay, thanks. Questions? So, are, are uh, there uh, questions? Uh, uh, uh. Yes. Have you any advice on setting up a kind of test environment? where you can actually hear this stuff. Well, I have no experience at all how to turn this stuff on. Is, is there any tricks I can do as an application author to, to help me spot errors that I'm making? Um, so Exerciser lets you check that it works. Um, actually testing would usually mean uh, trying to use the screen reader. 
and it's not easy to, 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 to learn how to use a screen reader. Um, mostly, what you can do, it's explained in the how-tos, you can just try to use your application with just the keyboard. And quite often you will notice that your uh, tab order is not interesting and things like this which just show okay your logic is not so good and quite often that's actually enough in that maybe your software will not be so much usable uh, I mean from an ergonomic point of view but at least it will be accessible people can use it and that's already a huge thing compared to uh, not being able to use at all Okay, is, is there a tool to visualize what ATK is picking out and sending out on its bus? It, um, on the bus, I don't know. You, you can actually uh, read from the bus and see what uh, is showing up, um, but usually it's too complex because you have all the insertions and etc. Um, what you can do, however, is just taking the Orca screen reader and enable the Braille monitor, which will show you what would be rendered on the Braille device. So you can have an idea of what is being seen by the, the people. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? So many applications now are web applications. Uh, yeah. How realistic is it to expect a blind person to be able to use a modern web application with JavaScript and a bunch of similar things, which annoy us already and are probably much more difficult for blind people. So um, I haven't talked about web accessibility at all because that's not the kind of thing I, I'm working on. And there is a huge um, work on this indeed, uh, which is being done at least. Um, JavaScript is not too much a concern. Flash was really uh, horrible for this. Um, the the tendency of the W3C is in the good way, in that uh, you have the browser which actually has the um, representation of the application which is being run, and then it can expose that to the screen reader. And then, of course, it's up to the application to have something which makes sense, etc., and not just a column and a column. And then that's uh, just the same thing applied to the people writing the website. And then the same, you would have scripts in the screen reader for a particular uh, website to put back some semantic in there. Well, I have one question. Mm -hmm. um, is in the Wayland model where every application is just outputting a PIX map, then maybe the, the place for accessibility is more into um, the, um, well, GTK or Qt. Um, this is something that you could use before the X server because uh, all the rendering was done in the X server, mm -hmm. but it's not done in the, uh, in this way now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and anyway, it was really not uh, convenient to see the text here, text there, but you don't have the semantic between both. So it's it's actually better to get like, uh, the uh, yeah. abstract representation from yeah, Qt or GTK. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, are they doing a good job? Say it again. Are they doing a good job so far? They, you mean the application writers? No, no, the oh. the the toolkit developers. Yes, yes, it's quite fine. Uh, GTK only for now. KDE really lacks manpower to actually implement it. There is some basic thing which is working, but but just for like uh, the label and that's all. So it's basically not usable. But at least technically there is something okay. which is pushed on the wire. Very well, thank you. Anyone else? Perfect, thank you again. Thanks.